This is a computer user's fantasy. It's essentially a software vending machine. All you do is bring along a blank floppy disk, and you can copy any one of more than a thousand programs, all free. Free, that is, if you're a student here at Clarkson University, where everyone has a personal computer. They're handed out at registration, along with the meal tickets and the class schedule. Today, we take a look at computers on campus on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you that software piracy is a federal offense. When a few people steal software, everyone loses. Additional funding is provided by CompuServe, by PC Connection and Mac Connection, by Byte Magazine and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange, and by Intel Corporation, Personal Computer Enhancement. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Schiffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, this is my new laptop computer. Okay. Not really. They don't come in yellow. <laughs> this is for kids, and it's, it teaches you spelling. It teaches you arithmetic. Uh, meant for kids is about the first or second grade level, perhaps. What I have up on the Macintosh is really neat. It's a calculus program. Uh, that teaches you calculus. You can sort of flip through the pages, as you can see, as if it were a textbook, but you can do more powerful things like click on a function and see what that function looks like. Click on a term and see how it's defined. Uh, you can go over here and after a while it'll give you a little quiz. Does this graph represent a function? Uh, I'd say no, etc. The stuff looks very powerful, but you know, in getting ready for the show, I spoke to one university professor and he said the computer as tutor has been a disaster. Why do you think that's been? Well, Stuart, I think we all know that human element has to be there. You know, a kid gets an A and pat in the back, a smile, you know, so <laughs> A little forth. smiling face on <laughs> the back doesn't do, quite no. make it. Yeah. <laughs> but computer-aided instruction has been around for years, ever since computers have been around, mm -hmm. essentially. And as, a, as an aid or a medium to learning, it's a, a tremendous and powerful tool. Uh, one of the things that Seymour Papert did in the MIT Learning Lab was really establish that learning about how computers work and programming was a very important part of uh -huh. the problem-solving process. Yeah, yeah. Well, it could be that uh, programs like this might even make calculus fun to learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoy <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Today we're going to focus on the use of computers at the college level and we'll visit two universities where every student is required to have a personal computer. We'll visit Drexel University in Philadelphia and Clarkson University in upstate New York. Clarkson University was founded in 1896 in Potsdam, New York, not far from the Canadian border. Located in a postcard setting of lakes, forests, and ski resorts, the campus has a traditional, even conservative appearance. But Clarkson made a break with tradition in 1983, when it became the first school to provide every student with a personal computer. The standard issue PC, a Zenith AT compatible, is not restricted to a certain classroom or building. Hey, what's up, Scott? A visitor hey, walking hey, into hey, any hey, dormitory hey, on hey, campus hey, will find one in every student's room among the posters, the stereo, and the sports equipment. In fact, the original concept was to make the student PC as ordinary as any other college possession. One of the interesting things we felt of the program would be that when the student comes, they have their PC, they go through four years of college with their PC, they're going to want their PC when they leave because they're going to have boxes and boxes of discs. Uh, as uh, someone once said, it's going to be like their old raccoon coat. They're going to want to take it away with them. It's very interesting. You ask, the fa you ask parents, isn't it wonderful that your student has a computer here at Clarkson? And they, everyone says, oh, yes, this is just great. You ask the student, isn't it wonderful that you have a computer while going through college? And they say, I guess. And the thing is, they've never been through college before without a computer. It's just the tool, it's the thing by which they go to college with, and it helps them. And so, sure, I guess it's nice to have. Clarkson began its innovative PC program in 1983, when a class of 800 incoming freshmen received the first computers. One of those students, now a Clarkson graduate, remembers the initial event. In the opening weekend, there was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of freshmen were checking in, picking up their computers, that was one of the big focus, getting your computer set up, going to all your computer orientations, trying to learn about your computer. And a lot of people, you know, after the first weekend, were hopelessly lost and had no idea what was ever going to happen. But uh, as the semester progressed and all the freshmen started in their first computer class, 
they'd start to learn more about how to program the computer. And you'd spend a lot of time getting together with friends. You know, you'd be helping a friend with a program, or you'd have a problem and a friend could come help you. By 1986, 4,500 computers had been distributed at the school. Students also had a growing number of software applications to choose from, all free, and most developed by Clarkson. The school had achieved compatibility in both hardware and software. By 1989, software was being distributed through so-called software vending machines, a group of networked computers around campus where students could download an entire library of programs for personal use, including a word processor called Galahad and a spelling checker known as Lancelot. It might seem like a technical support nightmare, hundreds of computer neophytes struggling to learn hundreds of new programs all at once, but it didn't turn out that way. We have student help uh, in this very office every from 10 o'clock through it till, till 4 or 5. Uh, someone sits on a, on a telephone out here, which is a hotline. So anybody gets stuck, they can call up and get some help. If it's uh, serious that uh, they really need help, uh, uh, hard disk crashed or whatever, uh, then the students will go to their, they'll do house calls to their particular location. So we have that kind of hand holding. But because we have so many computers on campus, there's always somebody close by that knows what's going on in general. While the personal PC is at the heart of Clarkson's futuristic concept, many other aspects of university life are becoming computer accessible. Clarkson's course catalog is now listed electronically in a computer database that will plan a student's academic program up to four semesters in advance. Using keyword searches, a student can browse through the catalog with their advisor to view course summaries, requirements, and prerequisites. One of the key elements of Clarkson's computerized campus is the ERC, or Educational Resources Building. Inside, there are some familiar-looking academic symbols, but they are being rapidly transformed by a program of electronic access to networks. Kind of the original theory was is that we would provide uh, here at the ERC the hub of a campus-wide information distribution and retrieval system. So our network uh, goes all over the campus. We are connected to the outside world via our regional network called NYSERNet, which is New York State Education and Research Network, which is part of this TCP IP uh, network scheme. And then from there to the NSF net, essentially to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And many times the students are the first ones to pick up on what's available out there by striking up some informal relationship with another student or a faculty or member of the administration. The ERC's card catalog is stored on CD-ROM disks, where books can be searched using keywords. Students also have access to an online interlibrary database called CARL, or Colorado Alliance of Research Libraries. CARL searches other libraries for relevant articles, providing titles and some online text. Both systems are accessible through library terminals and in the future by any modem-equipped PC. The whole idea and the idea behind this educational resources center is to uh, provide the next generation library, if you wish, um, rather than merely uh, acquiring publications in written form and putting them up on shelves and having them very hard to, uh, to locate and to search. Uh, this stuff will all be done electronically and what we're seeing now is, is the beginning stages of that. At present, Clarkson dormitories are not equipped with modem lines, so students must go to network stations for any outside communication. But students are communicating, both with each other and with the faculty. Professor Jay Paramaswaran uses a computer bulletin board to hand out homework assignments and electronic mail to help students solve homework problems. He says that he often signs on late in the evening to find that one of his students has just left a message. He can respond immediately, eliminating the need to meet during office hours to answer a simple question. Almost every part of academic life at Clarkson has been changed by the ubiquitous PC, from the classroom to the dorm room. More difficult to measure are the indirect effects and how well students have adapted to the routine of computer use. Well, I, I would say that in general, a student's um, 
take the comp assume the computer is a tool for their education, just like a uh, slide rule used to be or a notebook is or whatever. So I would, my, my view of it is that there's probably only like 10% of the students that are really uh, have a particular computer interest and an interest to go and do something different. From the 10% of students who are actively programming their computers have sprouted some ingenious applications. Clarkson winters can be severe with plenty of snow and temperatures well below zero. Bicycle rider Charles Anstey devised a way to go riding regardless of the season while overcoming the boredom of indoor exercise. Charles has connected a PC to his bicycle, which now provides a changing view of computer-generated scenery, including hills, curves, and even an occasional building. The road scenery advances according to the speed of the rear wheel of the bicycle, and it's authentic. The routes are based on existing roads around the Clarkson campus, minus the snow. In some ways, Clarkson's seven-year-old computer program has been remarkably problem-free, but there are some unresolved issues. The school would like to keep the system open and simple to use without risking the loss of security. And there are costs involved to maintain and administer the program. But in general, Clarkson's computer crusade seems to be more of an attraction than a burden. The majority of students who uh, come to Clarkson are aware of the program, uh, a very substantial majority. And they uh, affirm that it's, uh, it's a, uh, a plus in their decision to attend this institution. Here at the computer warehouse at Clarkson University, it's obvious there is one computing standard. Everybody uses an IBM-compatible MS-DOS machine. But at Drexel University in Philadelphia, they have a different approach. They call it the Macintosh capital of higher education. There are some 14,000 Macs on the Drexel campus. And just like at Clarkson, every freshman has to have one. Unlike Clarkson, the students here have to buy their computers. They're not issued by the university, and they're not included in the tuition. But there is little doubt the students like the idea. It will greatly enhance our chance of getting a better job, and enhance our chance of doing well in our job. And in this new program we're in, uh, the E4 program, Enhanced Educational Experience for Engineers, we have a larger amount of exposure from the normal student has. We're using programs like LabVIEW, which a normal freshman would doesn't even know that it exists. The decision to go all Mac was made back in 1983, before the Macintosh was actually introduced. It was a risky decision, and the first freshman class really didn't know what to do with those closed little boxes that had only 128K. I think when it started, everybody really didn't know what, what, what these machines are going to be used for. But as, as we progressed, as the second year you know, came around, the third year, we really began seeing the, the real use of this, and not only as uh, not only as something to type uh, and print out papers on, but really to use it as, as a tool for an engineer, which I think is probably the most important thing a computer gives us right now. The decision to go with the Mac was partly due to a great financial deal from Apple. The decision to force one standard on the entire university was part of the administration's overall strategy. We wanted to be able to, to systematize the system. We wanted to be able to have one machine. We wanted to be able to determine what the, the software bundles were so that under those circumstances, faculty members from all the different colleges may be working on the same system, have access to the same kind of software, and therefore we said, we strongly recommend that you acquire this, and actually what the students think when they come to the institution is that I must get this. It's part of the portfolio to be a Drexel University student. Having a Macintosh computer on every desk is great for learning, but there are some associated problems. A Mac in the dorm room is like having a video game arcade on your desk. And so computer games often become the main dorm room activity on the Mac. Software piracy is another problem. While the piracy is limited mostly to games, students freely swap software, though there is a strong university policy against unauthorized copying. And with lots of Macs and lots of copying comes a high risk of viruses. Indeed, Drexel suffered a major virus attack last year that has led to antivirus protection schemes for most Mac users here. Getting the faculty to support any new system is often a challenge, particularly so when it means forcing one computing platform on everyone. But the Drexel faculty has not only supported the all-Mac campus, they have become leading developers of educational software on the Mac. And while it's not quite publish or perish, 
Software development has become the new faculty status symbol of scholarly achievement. Many schools like ours have moved to recognize software development as evidence of scholarship, quality software obviously. And uh, today there is a much more of an inviting, uh, encouraging, rewarding environment for the newer blood in faculty. Faculty software development is big on this campus. There are regular brown bag lunches where faculty members show off their works in progress. Here, psychology professor Doug Shute is demonstrating his mental prosthesis program, a hypercard stack designed to help brain-injured patients cope with the daily tasks of life. One area where Drexel feels it's behind is in connectivity. With the emphasis in the past on putting a standalone Mac on every student's desk, Drexel is just now addressing the needs and the benefits of networking. There may be lots of sound pedagogical reasons why it's good to have everyone using a computer. But from the student's point of view, going through college with a computer on your desk also has other, simpler benefits. I think it makes it a lot more challenging a little bit, uh, very much more interesting, because it's something that you can, I don't know, when you, do, when you write something on a, on, a, on a book, when you're writing stuff down on a sheet of loose leaf, it's just homework. But if you do it on the computer, you feel like you're doing something more, something more exciting, more fun. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. Computers have obviously had the most significant impact on the students at Clarkson, but the fact that every student has a computer means the faculty can teach in a different way. 70% of Clarkson's undergraduates are science or engineering majors, two disciplines that make extensive use of computers. But in keeping with the goal of integrating the computer into everyday academic life, Clarkson faculty are turning the PC into a link between classroom instruction and individual study. Professor Richard Parch uses a portable computer to demonstrate principles of chemistry in class with a 3D program he helped to develop. Even on a monochrome screen, students can view the basics of molecular structure and then take the same software home to study individually. The PC program is a partial replacement for the Blackboard and a review tool that duplicates the classroom lesson. In circuitry design classes taught by Professor Jim Svoboda, the student PC has helped solve a frustrating problem that used to slow down his students' progress. What happens sometimes then is that there is a, a complicated analysis problem that must be solved as part of the design effort. Without the computer, that problem becomes a big hurdle and one that the students have a very hard time getting over. Later, when the students all had their PCs, they were able to use the PCs to help them with that analysis part of the problem. That brought their attention back to design it let them check their own work and correct the trivial mistakes that they had made along the way. The result was fairly dramatic. Now all of the students were getting circuits that did meet the specifications. The PC has had such an impact on the learning curve of this course that undergraduates are taking circuitry classes previously taught only to graduate students. Engineering classes are not the only ones to feel the impact of personal computers. Professor John Sirio's English class seems to be handing in more attractive writing assignments. In addition, making corrections to a student's first draft doesn't sound so ominous. Students come to me with drafts of their paper, and I don't feel like a, a, you know, a, a monster anymore when I say, look, I think you ought to restructure this and put this paragraph here and move this paragraph down here and so forth, because they can just go home and do a block delete and shift things around and tighten that structure and flow and so forth. But for the most part, uh, these students can write better sentences if they become a little conscious of what they're doing and strive for more active verbs. Now, has this improved their writing? Definitely. Professor Sirio has also found a use for the PC in his office, where he edits a poetry journal. The journal is still typeset at a distant plant, but the page layout and design are done entirely with a desktop publishing package, substantially reducing the cost of publication. At Clarkson's Educational Resource Center, a pilot project is underway to create a scholar's workstation built around a personal computer and some common peripherals. 
Librarian Jim Nolte has assembled a workstation that relies heavily on telecommunications to search for and extract documents from around the world. With a modem, a fax line, and a laser printer, a researcher can scan a thousand databases of the world's libraries for relevant material. Retrieving an article can be as simple as a fax transmission, while books use the postal system. The PC is also helping Clarkson's faculty to identify new students by providing instructors with digitized snapshots taken with a handheld video camera. Software developer Russ Nelson has created a database of student ID pictures, which he then assembles into a kind of class photo album to help teachers match names with faces. Clarkson has had seven years to perfect its groundbreaking PC program, enough time to bring out innovations small and large among its faculty and its students. But Clarkson's hardware supplier, Zenith Data Systems, reminds potential customers that they should be prepared. The college was considering uh, requiring all of their students to purchase computers, or at least at a departmental level, needs to think a lot about the after sale. Uh, systems that are in place uh, to provide service, support, training, to get uh, those students and our faculty, if that's part of the program, to, to use machines beyond what the two or three items that they were intended to use them for. And the other one is the cost, the cost of adding the computer up front. And that's something I don't need to tell, you know, tell the education community, but that's the, a major issue right now is does one in a, in a competitive education environment price themselves in or out of a market? For those universities that are not providing computers to their students, the Clarkson experiment serves as both an example and a warning of what the future holds. I think that schools that don't do what we're doing now uh, in five years, ten years, I have no idea, are going to be considered out of it. In other words, I really think that, that the race is over to try, to try to put it in the program in the sense of, gee, isn't this new and wonderful? It's now a race to put it in the program because it's necessary. I came in sort of scared because I really didn't have the background in it. And now that I know more about it, I'm more comfortable using it. And uh, it really surprises me how much, you know, how much you can learn and how much you can do just using the computer. I feel as though I would, I would notice more if it was gone now than it being there. That's how accustomed to it I've, I've become. It's an interesting idea, a university where every student has to have a computer. It's different. It's fun, but what's more important, it apparently works. Clarkson graduates are among the most sought after new employees, and the industry recruiters who visit this campus say it's because they all come to their new jobs computer literate. That's our look at computers on campus. We'll be back in just a minute with this week's computer news. In the random access file this week, Grid Systems has introduced a new 386 laptop with a pointing device that replaces the mouse. The tilting bar is built right below the keyboard space bar. The 12-pound laptop also comes with Windows 3.0 already installed on its standard 60 megabyte hard disk. Other features include a 3.5-inch floppy disk drive and a backlit VGA screen. Shipments are expected to begin next month. Commodore Business Machines is giving away free color monitors to customers purchasing an Amiga 2000 HD or 2530. Customers qualify for the $400 monitor if they buy one of the two computers by September 29th. Commodore says it hopes to boost its share of the small business market with their promotion. AST Research has announced a new toll-free telephone support service for its customers in the U.S. and Canada. Help is available Monday through Friday from 5 a.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific Daily Time, and the number to call is 800-727-1278. Technical assistance for systems-related inquiries will be provided free of charge to all end-users and non-service center resellers. And Hewlett-Packard says it's relocating the headquarters of its personal computer group from California to France. More than half of the company's PC and terminal sales generate abroad, and Europe has been its fastest-growing market. 
Some PC research and marketing operations will remain in the United States, and staff reductions at the Sunnyvale office are not expected. And for those others looking for hot tips into setting up business deals in the Eastern European market, you can now tap directly into the government's electronic economic bulletin board. The Commerce Department's Trade Opportunities Program provides export leads on a daily basis. It's updated as soon as new opportunities open up. Those wanting to subscribe to the system should contact the National Technical Information Service. A small subscriber fee may be charged. Well, not much movement in this week's top 10 PC software. According to PC Connection, Windows 3.0 still tops the chart, followed by PC Tools Deluxe. In next is WordPerfect 5.1, Expanded Memory Manager, and Quicken 3.0. Rounding out the top 10 PC titles are Grammatic 4, Newcomer Norton Utilities 5.0, Coral Draw, Procom Plus, and Word 1.0. WordPerfect says it is working to correct a problem in its newest word processor program, WordPerfect 5.1. The problem may cause a loss of data if users fail to notice a small pop-up prompt when saving a file without adequate storage space. That program placed third this week on our top 10 software list. In this week's Ask Dr. John feature, a viewer wants to know why a PostScript laser printer is better. With the answer, here is Dr. John Heilborn. The primary difference between a PostScript printer and other printers is the way in which they handle the dots and images that they produce. For example, the text in one of the more common printers uses a dot image that's hard, it's fixed, it can't be changed. On the other hand, PostScript uses what's called outlines of all the images. This allows them to scale and make them larger or smaller, all the different fonts and images that they use. You can rotate them and so on. If you take a look, this, for example, is a dot image and this is PostScript. It's a lot smoother, and it has a lot more flexibility. The one problem you might run into with a PostScript printer is that it costs a bit more, and they tend to be a bit slower. Other than that, they give you a lot of advantages. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Dr. John. And finally, motorists on the Ohio Turnpike can now shorten their refueling stop by using computerized gas pumps. Sixteen service stations along the Turnpike will get the computerized pumps, which accept credit cards and don't require any attendance. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Maria Gabriel. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, which offers online information related to today's subject. Members type Go Chronicles. Non-members call for more information. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, by PC Connection and Mac Connection, by Byte Magazine and VIX, the Byte Information Exchange, and by Intel Corporation, Personal Computer Enhancement. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.